Hey y'all, I am so back. And before year's end, can you believe that? Remember back in the beginning of the year when I said I want to make videos talking about things I create or things that at least inspire me to? Well, guess what? I got things to talk about now, and this year has been very fruitful for me. If I didn't already state it, and for those that don't know, I finally bit the bullet and decided that I want to develop games, and it's been an absolutely phenomenal decision, and the journey for it has been insane. It's a journey I'm glad I undertook, but hot damn did I need to do so much learning. So, for some background, I am an enterprise software developer, so that means I try to hold myself to certain standards with how I structure my code and architect my projects, and I carried over that same mindset for game development. The reason I wanted to do this, and the reason any developer would want to do this, is because it will usually make the project easier to work in, in the long term. You ever hear all those horror stories of games you've played having god-awful code and being hard to update or develop in? That's what those practices are there to prevent. So then, I decided I would begin working in Godot because I quite like the engine for a number of reasons, prime among them being that it's open source and I don't have to worry about any license changes or nothing. I also just appreciate, on a personal level, being a part of an ever-growing community and developmental efforts to make more open-source applications for people to use. My language of profession is C-sharp, but I started programming with Python, and while you can code your game in C-sharp, and the engine strongly supports it with the benefits of better performance, static typing, interfaces, and other programming stuff, I actually quite like GDScript, which is very similar to Python. It's essentially scripting with Python, and I respect the philosophy behind it as stated by the creator of Godot and now technical advisor, Juan Linietsky. He stated that he wanted a language where you can just hammer out code and get a desired result. You don't have to worry about static typing or boilerplates or nothing. You can get results as, as quick as you can type the code. With all of these tools in hand, I set out on my journey to find skilled and experienced developers willing to offer their knowledge and opinions on coding patterns and architecture. And what did I find? Nothing! There are none! Let me stop. There are actually a fair few developer content creators who do go in-depth behind their development methodologies, pipelines, and architectural practices, but I wouldn't say it's like a terribly large number. In fact, I'll be linking uh, some people that I very much recommend and are fantastic in the description. It's very easy to find yourself stuck in a sea of beginner tutorials and specific implementations that are more concerned with plopping down nodes and just calling it a day, but once you crawl out of that, things start getting a whole lot clearer. Unlike in web development, where I come from, you can't expect to find Microsoft Docs levels of information and tutorials detailing exactly how to accomplish things in the best, most optimal way possible. Of course, though, games are exponentially more complicated than websites. There's only so many ways to build a blog that creates, reads, updates, and deletes data in your desired programming language, as opposed to learning how to build Fortnite. Hell, even something as simple as the Mega Man clone can have a near infinite number of ways to build the damn thing. The responsibility of figuring out how to build things in the way you want lies more on yourself than with web development. But like I said, I'm a software developer. Part of my job is deciding what is relevant to getting work done and what is of literally no help. And that's exactly what I did. I found YouTubers that were more suited to someone of my background. I found game articles and Reddit threads. I was really learning. The most important thing I learned was the concept of state machines from a book called Game Programming Patterns by Robert Nystrom, which I definitely recommend, and I learned how to implement them from a YouTuber called Fairfight, who I also definitely recommend, will be linked in the description below. 
This isn't a tutorial video, so to keep it short, a state essentially defines what a game character can or cannot do while in a certain state of being. For instance, if your character was in a hanging from ledge state, you'd probably only want them to be able to shimmy from side to side, drop, or pull themselves up, and not be able to do things like sprint, go prone, or whatever, so you can change the control scheme to reflect that. This really helped me figure out how I want to structure code and gave me greater insight into how a lot of games function now, which helps me visualize how I want my own projects to play. Once I figured those out and started watching the videos by Fairfight, my third eye was really opened. He splits his states into small different scripts and nodes, which I really like, as opposed to just having a massive player script filled with your entire state machine. There are a lot of YouTubers who cover state machines in Godot, but once again, I had to figure out which methodologies I like and which ones I don't. A lot of Godot developers I found like to represent their state machines via enums, which is something I kinda recommend against because I saw how it could become unwieldy and just isn't very scalable, not to me at least. It all, it all just kinda came back down to just knowing what I wanted for my projects. But alright. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We're getting too in depth with the technical stuff, and I haven't even began actually talking about the game. So, moving on. I had decided to start developing the game that I'll talk about a little later in the video, but I found myself kind of getting hung up on the architecture I was so desperate to find. I felt so confined to trying to rigidly follow this architecture that I actually wasn't getting as much development done that I wanted. Architecture is supposed to be malleable and more of a framework than any hardline rules, but it still stopped me from developing because I spent so much time trying to adhere to it, and after so long of this, I decided to just uh, forget about it and just full send it. Once I set myself free of trying to be a code perfectionist, that's when I actually started making great progress on my game. I was implementing feature after feature, seeing success after success, and the best part is I was still able to adhere to the parts of the architecture I liked. I still got state machines, and I'm still splitting them up into smaller files, except instead of implementing my own version of a state machine, I'm using a great add-on called State Charts. I don't really know if I'm using signals the right way, and I'm definitely not adhering to signal up call down philosophy, and you know what? <laughs> I don't care! If my game is working as intended with no drawbacks, then that's what matters the most, in my opinion. I can, of course, always just go back and refactor when I get closer to release anyway. Any mistakes I make aren't forever. That's the point of Git and GitHub. Side note, more developers should really learn about Git and GitHub. It's, it's, it's fundamental to being a developer. Source control is important. Google those words. Source control. But after coming to that realization, I felt so liberated. I felt so free. Melee. Now, what in the world am I working on exactly? What have I been doing the past few weeks? I'm sorry, I work on a weird schedule. It is what it is. I've been developing a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. Was that the bite of 87? Why am I developing a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game? <laughs> well, it's because there's no better way of learning to develop something than to actually develop something. This makes sense, I promise. And I thought for a minute on what I should try and develop, and ultimately I wanted something simple, but not too simple. I was developing a Crackdown esque prototype demo, but I thought that would be a little too big of a task to accomplish, so I put that a little further down the development list. FNAF games usually aren't the most complex things in the world. You sit in an office facing off against a small group of enemies via actions that are done by pointing and clicking. Working from that simple base allows you to make a game as simple or as complex as you like, adhering as close to the original vision as you want, or making it as disparate as you desire. 
It's also a dynamic enough property that you can give it any aesthetic tone that you like, from all the great FNAF analog horror that has cropped up in the past few years, as well as a new generation of fan games, you'll see a lot of people give their own unique take on the universe and the formula. Some of them set out to be a lot more personal in their horror, focusing on the tragedy of the Afton family. Some choose to do away with the whole original story and want to make it more of a slasher with angry spirits and big robots. The Joy of Creation, for instance, is really meta in its story where you just straight up play as Scott Cawthon, the series creator. T-Jock also has a wholly new gameplay loop and even one that's completely different from night to night. Return to Bloody Nights, Graveyard Shifts, Five Nights at Candies opts to follow a more traditional formula where the gameplay loop is consistent throughout. Now, despite the three games I mentioned all having a gameplay loop reminiscent of that of the original FNAF series and the same general concept for story, they all go about it very different ways with their own spin on the gameplay, their own art style, and their own tone for each respective game. From this simple foundation, you are able to go in any direction as you like. And now I'm going to describe the direction that I decided to take. Now I'm going to go ahead and actually talk about the tangible things that I've done and can show you. That being the gameplay and how the gameplay is going to function. I should clarify, this level and the animatronic positions don't represent what it will look like in the final game. This is more of a testing grounds for the systems I'm developing. With that said, let's finally talk about this project. For my FNAF fan game, I'm going to go with a consistent traditional gameplay loop. You are in an office, defending against monsters that want to murder you, for a certain amount of nights with ramping up difficulty. Nothing new there, but instead of maintaining power or temperature or office systems, I want the player to maintain the health of their doors that will remain closed and locked the entire night. So in about half of all mainline FNAF games, there are no doors. You are left to deal with the animatronics in different ways. In the other half, there are doors where you keep them closed by maintaining the power levels, or in the case of FNAF 4, you just kind of close them. Okay, so the first night is never usually that bad in any of the games, so I'll play through- But the animatronics are in the same room as you, so it's like, you're not really safe. What I want to do is have the player maintain their safety or fortification as opposed to their power. Being in a confined enclosed space for a short amount of time may not sound appealing, but I always felt the best when Bonnie and Chica were at both of your doors in FNAF 1 and they were both closed. Granted, your power was running down, but there was something that felt good about being protected on both sides. Nothing could get to you, it just felt safe. To me, the doors have always been an unsung ally in your fight for survival, so this is why I want the doors to be closed for the entirety of the night, not meant to be opened. So you'll be in the office, watching the cameras, and also maintaining the integrity of the doors, armed with a blowtorch that you'll apply to the doors that heal them from the damages animatronics will inflict upon them, in their attempt to get to you. As you can see, I have the very basics of this implemented. You swivel back and forth in your chair, then the doors take damage and can receive repairs. Not a whole lot to talk about there, other than the fact I was really happy. I was able to get composition working on this bit. Uh, composition's another programming pattern full of jargon that I'm not going to get super into, but just know that it's another pattern in programming that's really important. Just like with state charts, I did not roll my own compositional library. I actually got this off of GitHub from a user called Blue Matt, who you'll see on the screen now. Really, really helpful. I'm really grateful for this. There's a lot of interesting things that you can find on GitHub that people have released entirely for free from the kindness of their hearts. I, I definitely recommend going on GitHub and putting in the search crew qu uh, query language GD script. It, you'll, you'll find a lot of good stuff. But yeah, that's it for the doors. I also have the basics of the camera system implemented, which I am super proud of. It may not look special, but one thing I'm really excited to talk about is how I made the cameras kind of diegetic. In a lot of fan games, and in the main games especially, the camera takes up your full view and actually replaces the default screen. 
I was inspired by the joys of creation to have the camera be an in-game object you interact with and look at, with the office being in the rest of your view. This is a cool mechanic because there's moments where Chica will try to wiggle her way into your office through a wall, and you can see her do so while you're looking at the cameras. I wanted to do a similar thing in my game, except while looking at the cameras, you'll see sparks and pieces of the door flying from the directions of whatever door is getting attacked. This will be combined with game mechanics you'll interact with through the cameras, such as activating noise lures to semi-control where the animatronics go, like FNAF 3, and activating traps to delay them. This then will serve the purpose of getting the animatronics away from the door so you can repair it, because obviously they need to do more damage than you can fix, or at the very least, stop you from being able to fix it in general. So when an animatronic is knocking down your lifeline, I want the player to have this rush of panic to try and get it away all the while watching as their safety net is literally being torn apart next to them with a monster trying to rip its way right to you. You see what I mean when I say creating things is a wonderful experience? This system that I've started creating is coming together in unity to make a complete experience, and I have the wonderful job of making it a good experience. <sighs> oh boy. But we're not done, because the animatronics also have a fun twist. It's the same as the mainline games. There's some math that I'm doing using a timer, and the difficulty number being compared to a movement opportunity number, but I added one more random number in the mix. So when the animatronics get to a certain position, they will then randomly decide to go down one of three paths. There will be a default path, where they go to one more position, and then go into the door position. There will be the scenic path, where they go to two more extra positions before going on the default path. And there will be a shortcut path, where they go just straight to the door. I think the RNG of FNAF is pretty cool, and I want to use this to add a little more pressure and surprise to the player. I also just want to add more uncertainty to the animatronics. After all, there's nothing like the horror of the unknown, and not knowing what the monsters will do, I think would be good. Like I said, this doesn't represent the final positions or nothing. There could be more, or there could be less. You know, just gotta fill it out. See what's going on. Although, now that I describe it out loud, I should find a way to program weighted chances so the animatronic doesn't end up taking a shortcut three times in a row by pure chance. I could see it becoming very frustrating. Maybe also some kind of adaptability mechanic, where they become less susceptible as the night goes on to once again increase that difficulty factor. I have some more ideas I want to do for the sound lures that I will reveal when I get closer to adding those mechanics and features to the game. But as of writing this video, I should currently be in the process of adding the clock mechanic. I'm taking a small break to write this video because I'm just so excited to show off what I have so far, even if it's bare bones. But believe me, a lot of progress has been made, and will continue to be made. Before I stop talking about the gameplay and start talking about the aesthetic style, I gotta give a shout out to the developer who made a tutorial series about making a FNAF 2 clone in Godot. Bipel's short series has been instrumental in me making this project. Their project served as a great jumping off point, and I definitely recommend giving them a follow. I'll put a link down in the description below. Moving on from the gameplay I've built out so far, I want to talk about the style and vibe I'm going for with the art and story. And there's nothing here. Obviously. What, you think I started adding art to the game before I actually got the game working? What do you think I am, crazy? Instead, I figured I would explain what I want to go for with this game. So FNAF is usually paranormal horror. Children and people who were murdered and started possessing the animatronics they were stuffed inside of, with the technology involved taking a back seat in the focus. But you see, I think Sister Location has my favorite style out of all the mainline games. The advanced technology and the building the game takes place in, covered in sparks and steel tubing everywhere, having an AI assistant, I just dig how much more advanced it was in comparison to the other games. It was still paranormal in nature, but it did focus a little more on the tech of it, so I'll actually be looking at that for inspiration. Instead of ghosts and vengeful spirits, my story's gonna put the technology of it at the forefront and adopts more the tropes from the cyberpunk genre. Not like the criticizing capitalism bit, but more like, you know, human soul in comparison to technology bit. 
The story is going to be a do-over from Ground Zero, starting with Henry and William Afton perfecting a technology that can copy the consciousness of living creatures into digital data and then putting it into machines of their creations, which comes with all kinds of wicked implications. You take on the role of an engineer hired by the terrible robot workplace and you do double shifts as a security guard, cause you need the money and your job sucks. See, I lied. It's still gonna be a critique of capitalism. Stick some iron in your mouth and pull the trigger. I do have more written, but I'm going to choose to hold off on it until a later date. <laughs> I am also very inspired by Soma. Soma is like what comes to my mind first when I think of sci-fi horror. I'm not going to explain the entire story of Soma here, but just know it contains uh, gross uses of technology that make you feel disgusted with it and scared, with people and robots whose souls and bodies were violated and mashed together. Some of them were fine with their situation, but others were an anxious, confused, angry mess whose existence was nothing but perversion and confliction, and I think that would be perfect for the type of FNAF I aim to do, and I look forward to getting to explore that. Well, that's all I have for now, folks, and I think for once, since starting to make videos, I can see where I want to go, and I look forward to it. Writing this video was very fun, because making this game is very fun. Working on this project is the most fun I've had in, like, years? Working on my own personal projects, because for once it feels like it's something I can pump a lot of effort into and share with people, and it doesn't feel like I'm stuck in tutorial hell. I am learning, but this project is much more than just learning, it's creating. Get it? But yeah, still don't know how to close out videos, but just know, some good things are happening, and even better things are coming. So like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications, and stay tuned.